Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, a little, so while you're turning there, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. You know, sometimes it happens. You, you preach and then you, you get done and you're sitting later that afternoon you're like, man, I should have said that. <clears throat> so, you know, I realize, so I, I have a tendency just to put my heart out there. Uh, and I'll expose things about my life usually when I'm preaching, just so you all know my, my life is interacting with the text and with the Word, and I'm struggling just like the rest of you are. But I realize that, you know, when we open our lives up, there, there is, uh, it opens the door for affirmation, uh, criticism, <laughs> yeah, disagreement, all of that. So I, I realize that, that that can happen. And so... You know, last week we were talking and I was sharing just some thoughts about Les and I and how we've raised our kids and handled them and that. And just let me say that the examples I give, they're examples. They're, they're sort of, they're a for instance. And I, so just take them as that. They're examples. I, I think that they're good examples. I, I, but it's just my, my life trying to wrestle with the principles, my wife trying to wrestle with the principles. But you know, one of the things I so I'm so burdened with, you know, looking at the the age in which we live and the kids and how we're raising them and that I the strength I think it's lacking. It's so lacking. I have this new hero. Okay, so bear with me for a sec. So I have this new hero, Charles Simeon, 71 years old. He was pastor of Trinity Church, Cambridge, England for 49 years. The man went through all kinds of difficulty. I mean, serious difficulty. And I can't even walk through all this stuff. I just don't even know how he dealt with it. But he had a difficult ministry. It's just what the Lord had for him. It was his lot. So his friend Joseph Gurney asked him one time how he endured and how he outlasted all the prejudice and everything that he faced. And, I mean, he faced so much ridicule from his students and other teachers and so on. So this was Charles Simeon's statement. He says, My dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. Just let me repeat that. My dear brother, we must not mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I am getting through a hedge, if my head and shoulders are safely through, I can bear the prickling of my legs. Let us rejoice in the remembrance that our holy head has surmounted all his suffering and triumphed over death. Let us follow him patiently. We shall soon be partakers of his victory. My concern, you know, when I use the example of kids falling down at early age, you know, go back to Proverbs. They look to us to see how to respond to things in life, especially difficulties, hardships. They, they look to us, and it starts at a young age when they first start walking. When they fall down, they look to see how we respond. If we run to pick them up and swoop them up, right, then they're going to get in a pattern of doing that every time. And they don't learn to just get up and brush it off. Now, I understand that if you have a delicate child and you don't want to fall down all the time, that's fine. That's just an example. But my point is simply that it starts early and we prepare them at an early age to face hardships in life. And, and my concern is that we face persecution, opposition, slander, misunderstandings, disappointments in life, self-recrimination, there's self-blame. This happens in ministry all the time. If something goes wrong, I'm always asking, well, what did I do? People leave. Why, why do they leave? What did I do? What did I say? Why, how come more people aren't here? How is it my... So I, it's always, you're always looking at yourself. You go through these things. You face this in life. You face it in the Christian life. But my problem is, is that in our day and age, there is this pervasiveness in our times of emotional fragility. We are so emotionally fragile. And when you look at the, the, the world that surrounds us, we are easily hurt, we're, we're, we easily pout, we easily mope, we break easily, our marriages break easily, our faith breaks easily, our happiness breaks easily, our commitment to church breaks easily. We're easily disheartened and it seems like we have very little capacity for striving in the face of criticism and opposition. And my issue is this, that when you look at scripture, virtues are endurance, perseverance, steadfastness. Where are those things, right? Where are those things? And I'll just tell you, it starts young, but ultimately we want to lead them, Proverbs chapter 3 last week, we want to lead them to where their sanctuary of soul is in the Lord, right? That's ultimately where we want to lead them, but it, it starts in early age. So just to say, those were examples of mine, and, and you know, I tell my boys, like, and my daughter, 
unless you're bleeding profusely or something's broken, don't come crying. There, there's time for tears. And even sometimes, listen to me, even sometimes when, when we want to cry and it's that bad, we need to cry. Sometimes you still use the Greek word, hupafero. We have to underneath it bear up and keep walking and cry later. Right? And, and something is missing in, in our children this day and age where they need safe zones at universities because they need to have an area where everyone thinks the same and says the same thing because they don't want their feelings hurt because someone disagrees with them. This is the age in which we live. And we raise our children to be that way. This generation was raised by somebody. The millennials was raised by somebody or not raised by somebody, yeah? So let's go to Ephesians. And let's read this morning. And this is just a, a, this is part one of part two, Brandon, just to let you know. So go with me to Ephesians. And I handed out an outline for you. So if you have that, just sit and just go for a ride. This is all preparatory. But let's start in, in verse 21 of chapter 5. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church, and he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it will be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as man-pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, tender service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them. Give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So I, I bring you to this passage this morning, and, and this is all, uh, this is backdrop. So like the play last night, it was an awesome job, man. Uh, like the backdrop of a play, it, it sets the scene, sets the stage for everything that takes place, right? And so it's crucial. So this is crucial. And the, the title of this message is The Home and the Cosmic Purpose of God. My hope is that you will see that home life is far bigger than oftentimes we imagine it to be. It's a part of something so much more grand that God has designed. And, and the same with the church, the beauty of the church and what God has established for it. And so hopefully we will gain some truths. And I know that this is a familiar passage for all of us, but I bring you here anyway. But hopefully there will be new thoughts that will come and we will get into the details next week and then move into Mother's Day. But I just, I, this, this letter is, I, man, it's been my favorite for so long. And there's, there's just no way you can read Ephesians and stay there and be depressed. You just, you can't. You can't. It is just one of those books that is so transcendent. And Paul begins this way in the first chapter, in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. His thoughts are, are beyond the limits of time. He starts off with that we were chosen before the foundation of the world. His mind moves in a realm of conceptions that are beyond what normally ordinary men think about. He moves in the realm of the Spirit. And there's a phrase that happens five times in Ephesians. It doesn't happen anywhere else. In the heavenly places. And it's a recurring thing that runs through this whole letter. In other words, Paul is constantly pressing our minds out there 
It is such a transcendent letter. It is an otherly letter. This is such a transcendent letter that a friend of mine, when we graduated seminary together, we both took exegesis class with my dad going to Ephesians. And so I was talking with him a couple years down the line, and we were both serving in Russia. And I said, have you preached to Ephesians yet? He said, no. He said, I, I just can't get there yet, man. He said, it's just so lofty that I don't even feel like I'm worthy to go there yet. It's just one of those books. And Paul starts off by contemplating the perfections of God and the purposes of God. And we're going to come back to the purpose of God because our home life has everything to do with God's cosmic purpose. And the thought is unity. That is one of the issues. And that is a key issue in here. But he starts off this way. And so this letter is so lofty, but it's amazing to me that as he contemplates these things in the first few verses of this letter, it's 202 words. He just piles one thought upon another. It's a total run on sense. He has eight of those in this letter. He is so caught up by these amazing theological truths, doctrine truths, as he's sitting in his prison cell and he's writing these things to the churches. And then I don't believe this was strictly to Ephesus. It was a circular letter. But as he writes this letter to the churches, he wants him to comprehend these truths, but he's so caught up by them, he can't even stop. This is like me when I was writing in college, you know, we'd have a writing assignment, and I just kept putting commas all the time. I couldn't find a place to put a period. You just get caught up in what you're thinking. That's Paul. Such glorious truths that he just keeps going on and on and on with these things. And so what's amazing is that in light of this fact that this grand and glorious letter, this lofty letter, transcendent letter, this heavenly letter, that he would put such a huge focus on the home. Now think about that for a minute. That's a huge statement. And I'll show you the significance of the movement of this letter, how important the home is. And we need to know that because sometimes I know that, that we look at home life and, and you know, it's the, the laundry and the dirty socks and it's the clothes and toys all over the place and all that stuff. And we see this and we look mundaneness, right? And that's what we think sometimes, but it's so much greater than that. And hopefully these truths will help us see beyond all the clutter, right, to the real reality of what lies behind our home and the impact that it should have. And where should we go with it? So contextually, I, and again, this is setting the stage, but contextually, we're going to look at this particular passage together, but broader, how it fits into everything. But this section begins, it's interesting, if you notice, verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands, ask the Lord. It begins without any kind of connection at all. There's no grammatical connection. There isn't a particle. There is no conjunction. There's nothing here. It just moves from verse 21 into verse 22. And I'll just tell you this, that the verb, and you notice that it's in italics in your NAS. I don't know if it's in the others. Be subject. It's in italics because it's not in verse 22. In other words, grammatically, they pick it up from verse 21 and carry it over. In other words, there is a flow from what proceeds right into this. Now, this is very telling, and this is important, because it goes all the way back to being filled in the Spirit. All right? We'll come back to that in a minute. Martin Luther called this scheme the house tafel, meaning a list of rules for the household, but was usually translated in English, the house table. And this section of rules was also formulated, it was called the station codes, in Christendom. And the reason for this is because each member is addressed according to the role and their position within the household. And so here is the flow of the passage, and it is the same for every group that is dealt with, every household member. So, for instance, emphasis the first one, the wives. So they're named first. You have the wives mentioned in 522. Wives, be subject to your husbands. We're going to have the same thing in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Same thing with children, same thing with slaves. So each member is going to be referred to. There's going to be a command given, the imperative mood. Now I'll just tell you this command is borrowed in verse 22, wise be subject. This command is borrowed from the previous context, but it is an imperative. Although in verse 21, it's a, it's a participle. I don't got time to explain Greek to you, but it just is. You have to take my word for it. And then the motivating statement, why do we do this? And I love this because God gives us the motivation. He tells us, why do we do this? So for the wives to be submissive to husbands, for the husband is head of the wife. That's the reason. And it's natural. Any society you look at, it is natural that they are going to have specific rules or standards by which life is to be ordered, whether politically, domestically, socially, religiously. Throughout history, we can see this to be so. In other words, even the pagan world understood that there was an order to the world in which we live. So J.A. Robinson, and I tell you, if you're going to get any commentary in Ephesians, this is the one. He says this. He says, the glad life of the Christian community is a life of 
duly constituted order. <coughs> you think about this. And this is being an assault today. It's being assaulted even within the context of the church. He goes on to say, the apostle of liberty is the apostle of order and subordination. Now, I just tell you, these words are very uncomfortable for us in America. But, but they are necessary words. They're, they're a part of God's design. There is an order, and, and even the pagan world understood this fact. But it's interesting that Paul, out of all the writers of the New Testament, he likes this word. And it's usually translated, be subject. He uses it 23 times in his writings. And he uses it in various ways. So I'll give you some key examples on how Paul talks about our submission. Chapter 13, verse 1 of Romans, uh, some have a problem with this. It is what it is. 13.1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment, and the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. So if you have an authority problem, you have a God problem, right? Not only in the realm of, of right, society at large. 1 Corinthians 14, this is dealing with the context of worship and spiritual gifts. He says this, Indeed, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not characterized by disorder, but by peace. And the problem was that they were using their gifts, but it was disorderly. They were all discombobulated. And Paul says, look, you've got to have some order to your worship. God is not a God of disorder. And there is an issue of submission. Bring it into the grand scheme of God. Chapter 15, verse 20 to 1 Corinthians. If we ever get back there, we'll get here. And when all things are subjected to him, the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. This is the final consummation of everything. Subjection, subordination is a part of God's design. For us to ignore it, run away from it, is to walk away from the order that God has established. And even historically, when we look at the various people groups in the nations, they understood this to be so. In the Greco-Roman world, household was viewed as a foundation of the state. They understood that it had an impact upon society. And proper management of the household then was vital to a social political concern. So if they wanted to order them themselves politically and in society, they, they needed to bring order to the home. There had to be a code. There had to be a code. Aristotle, the same thing, the first century, he developed this management of household. And it was carried on through Dias Chrysostom, Seneca, and many others. They carried this thought process on. This is the pagan world. Even the Jewish writers, Philo and Josephus, they adopted Aristotle's outline of the household management. And they carried this on in regards to society. But I'll just tell you, the passages that we find in Colossians and Ephesians, there is no extent writing that is quite like these ones. And I'll just say that if we want to understand the home, understand marriage, understand family, we need to come to these passages. They are so vital because they give us reciprocal obligations. And they give us the model and the motivation for why we do what we do. And it has everything to do with Christ. He bathes everything in the home. And if he doesn't, then we're failing in our tasks that God has given us. And then we can say then we are not within the order that God has designed. The members, if we look at these passages, everyone has their own role and responsibility. It's honorable. They're important. Everyone is unique. And I'll come back to this next week. We talk about unity. Everyone has their place. Everyone makes up the family. The kids, everyone, they have, are a part of, vital part of that. And I'll just tell you that the home is basically the church in miniature. So Paul's going to highlight the value of each, the dignity of each, but everyone has their place. Everyone has their worth. Theologically, notice with me, Paul is going to ground this in Genesis. He starts in, in verse 31, and he just gives this quote for us. But we know that underneath all of this lies the Genesis account. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is an idea that's going to go back to chapter 1 as he talks about the great cosmic purpose of God, the unifying of everything in Christ. He uses this to look back to that. But he's establishing this in Genesis. In other words, if we want to understand what our roles are within the home, we have to go back to God's design first. When we understand the design, then we understand how to function in that. This is the same thing with the issue of the church. If we want to know how to function in the church, we need to know the nature of the church. If we don't know that, then the understanding of function isn't going to work. Not only that, but there is a Trinitarian pattern to all of this. A truly Christian marriage will mirror a relationship between Christ and the church. The two are so closely intertwined together. 
Now just think about this because this command goes backwards. Notice with me, chapter 5, verse 18. Okay, this is where it flows out from. He says, do not get drunk with wine, but for that is dissipation, but be filled in the Spirit. Everything flows out of that. So you have the Holy Spirit is working and we also have Christ. So here's the fact about the home. Our homes are supposed to be theologically driven. Just think about it. Theologically driven. Theology should drive everything that happens in our home. And to the degree that we understand Christ's relationship to the church, to the degree that we understand the doctrine of the Trinity, to that degree we will function as God wants our homes to function. It's just a telling, a telling statement and is a vital, important truth to the household. So notice with me, here's the, the programmatic statement, verse 21. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is the overall blanket statement introducing the topic. Then we have three paragraphs that is going to, Paul's going to elaborate on what it means to function in this submissiveness. He's going to talk about the wives, husbands, so on, but he is going to explain very clearly what he is talking about. But I want to give you this quote by O'Brien because he says this. He says, We are not free to retain a supposedly exalted view of Christian marriage with its loving service, commitment, trust, growth on the one hand, and at the same time jettison hierarchical patterns of submission and subordination on the other because they are expressions of an outmoded first century worldview that are unacceptable in our contemporary situation. In other words, you cannot say you have a godly household and a godly marriage if you jettison submission and subordination. That is a part of God's design. It's the way God designed it to be going back to Genesis. The headship of the man has always been has never changed never changed and it has changed in this world and the conversation has changed and we know that society has manipulated it and you can ask well how so let me give you an example so we have new TV shows that come out the modern family right so if you hold to the view of marriages between one man one woman for life they refer to that as the traditional view so here you have the modern family and now you have the traditional view well, what are they trying to communicate by that terminology? That the traditional view is old, right? It's traditional, it's past, it's bygone. But here's the modern, the new, the updated version. So our minds, because we're so technologically in tune with everything, we're always looking for the 2.0. So we're supposed to all of a sudden move because of the conversation, the terms that use that this modern thing is the better thing, the newer thing, and that's what we go to. No. No, and don't use the vocabulary. It's not the traditional view. It is the biblical view. Amen. And that is what we stand on. And for me, it is a non-negotiable. And so for me, when it comes to politics and everything else, that drives my decisions on who I vote for and who I back. Will they uphold what I believe to be universals that are foundational for every society? So we cannot jettison God's design. So therefore, the husband loving his wife as Christ loves the church, or the wife gladly submitting to her husband as the church is subordinate to Christ. These two things, love and submission, are non-negotiables. They are non-negotiables. And the problem is that we just tend to cross over and get muddled up in the areas we're not supposed to be muddling. That's why he says, wives, that's for the wives. Then he says, husbands, that's for the husbands. Husbands, we worry about our thing. Wives worry about their thing. And if they're not doing their thing, then we pray and ask the Lord to move their heart to do their thing. Okay, but our thing is our thing. <clears throat> so here is the passage, and, and just some truths. This is general. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna move through this. Let me just set this out for you, and you will just get the outline. If you get it in the flow and you have the notes, that's good. And they, like I say, this is all preparatory. The prominence of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. For Paul, he starts off, chapter 4, verse 1. And this is where we have to start because this is actually where our context starts. So notice with me in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called. This is the blanket statement for everything that is to follow. But notice how Paul talks about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting because twice he's going to mention the fact that he's a prisoner. In chapter 3, verse 1, he's going to talk about a prisoner of Christ Jesus and what's significant about the wording there. And just you have to stop and ask yourself, why does he say that? So in chapter 3, he says, I'm the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Why? Because he's going to talk about his unique ministry to the Gentiles. So he is a prisoner of Christ. But in chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to lay out all the exhortations and admonitions to the church. So therefore, he refers to himself as a prisoner of the Lord. So he is going to highlight the lordship. 
as he moves into this next section and he is going to reveal the fact that his life is also subject to the Lordship of Christ. He acknowledges the fact that the Christian life is to be lived in the sphere of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so therefore when he addresses him as himself, he says, I'm a prisoner literally in Lord. In Lord. Now this starts off this process and it's going to lead into the section on family, but kurios is derived from kuros, which means power. So when used in reference to Lord, and it's interesting that in chapter 5 when it talks about masters, it's the same term. They are lords. They are possessors, owners of, right? So masters of the slaves, it's the same term. But there's only one, the Lord. And so when it's used in reference to God, He is the Mighty One, He is the Possessor, capital P, He is the Ruler, capital R, He is the one who has legal power and authority. And Paul looks at his life as he's sitting in prison, he's in Roman prison, and it is in the sphere of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now just think about this for a moment. Just think about this for a moment. When he was taken in captivity in Jerusalem, because he supposedly took a Gentile where he wasn't supposed to go, and the mobs then went into a big uproar and they wanted to destroy him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted him off the face of the earth. They just, this guy had to be written rid of. The guards get involved. All of that starts this whole long course for his life. He's going to go through imprisonment. You know that he's in Caesarea? Read the account. In Caesarea, he is there for over two years. Two years. He meets before Felix, then Festus, then Agrippa, then finally he's going to get sent to Rome. He goes through shipwreck, snake bite, all of this stuff, right? He finally gets to Rome. Then he's imprisoned in Rome. And he writes Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians. So he's finally there. So just think about that. Almost two and a half years of your life in Caesarea, gone, wasted, sitting in a jail cell. Right? And then he sits in Rome after finally getting with all the stuff. That, and he sits down and he looks and he goes, it was all done in the sphere of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm not the prisoner of Rome. I'm not the prisoner of the Jews. I am not the prisoner of this house that, that I'm incarcerated in or of this soldier. I am a prisoner in the sphere of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's a huge statement. But what does it tell us? This tells us that when you are walking in the will of the Lord, just understand this, you are going to suffer hardship. Sometimes we think when we're walking in the will of the Lord and we're, we're, we're following His sovereign hand and things, somehow we think that everything is be hunky-dory, peachy cream. No, 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 no. All of the hardships that Paul went through was all a part of God's sovereign design. He wanted him to go through those things. You read in, chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. So after he appears with the Jerusalem council, then the plot, in, in the last part of chapter uh, 23, the plot to take away his life in the middle is this verse. This verse, the Lord appears to him at night and he says, have courage just as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. This was before at the beginning when everything started. So everything from then on out, he knew that God was orchestrating everything. So then when Felix is waiting for a bribe to get him out of jail and says, he doesn't give him a bribe, he just stays there. Every time Felix calls him in, he just testifies. I <laughs> just testify, man. That's what I'm here for, brother. I'm testifying. Bear witness to Christ. Such an amazing truth. You look at Colossians. Let me just give you a run through. Colossians, we've been going through it on Wednesday nights, every other Wednesday night, the preeminence of Christ, same flow. We have in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, the hymn. He deals with the lordship of Christ over creation and the lordship over the church. He deals with the preeminence of Christ in ministry, chapter 1, verse 24 through 2, 5. The preeminence of Christ in salvation and sanctification. Just follow me. Don't even worry about writing this down. The preeminence of Christ practically lived out in every area of life. He's going to talk about the fact that Christ is seated in the heavenly places. He's going to say, continues to be seeking and continues to be setting your heart, heart and mind upon that. Then he moves into dimension of personal life, corporate dimension, then domestic life. And essentially he gets down to the home and he says, you need to live this heavenly life in the home. In other words, the Lord must dictate the household. Notice this passage in Colossians. Over and over we have the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. He goes on to deal with the children, right? Children, obey your parents for everything, for this is pleasing in the Lord. As he deals with the slaves in regards to their master as fearing the Lord. Over and over, we see the Lordship of Jesus Christ throughout this passage, right? Whatever you do, work indeed in enthusiasm as to the Lord. Verse 24, because you know that you receive your inheritance from the Lord, serve the Lord. Over and over, it's the Lord, it's the Lord, it's the Lord. When we come to Ephesians, it is exactly the same thing. No Notice with me in chapter 5, verse 21, as he starts this whole thing off, be subject to one another, what? In the fear of Christ. 
Not in the fear of one another, in the fear of Christ. That starts this whole section off, verse 22, as to the Lord, 23 and 24, as Christ is head of the church. Verses 25 through 27, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for, just as Christ also does the church over and over. It is the Lord, it is Christ. All over this place, we have the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, somehow in our homes, Christ must be Lord. There is only one Lord of the manor, and it's Him. And it's Him. And I ask you, and this is a rhetorical question, how are we making the Lordship of Christ evident in our homes? How are we doing that as husbands and wives and as parents? Because we're not just talking about theology class. We're not just sitting down instructing them in the Lordship of Christ. They, they need to see it and how we act and how we behave and how we respond. How are they seeing that in our life? Do they see everything that we do bathe in the sphere of the Lordship of Christ? There must then be Lordship in the home. Christian conduct is to be motivated and determined by Christ as the Lord. And Christian homes and relationships therein should be dictated by the awareness that Christ Jesus as Lord is the center of the home. Do our children see that He has sovereign rule over everything that happens? Somehow we need to flush this out in our lives. The prominence of the home. This is unmistakable by how Paul sets up the passage. So here we go. He starts us off in chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to walk through the next couple points and set the stage. But notice with me. So Watchman Nee wrote a book, Sit, Walk, Stand. That's really the book. Three words, sit, walk, stand. Chapters 1 through 3, sit. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Walk, chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through 6, 9. Then we get to the spiritual forces, right? Our fight against Satan. He says, stand firm, right? Don't walk, stand firm, right? Take a defense. Put on the full armor of God. Amazing flow. We're in the walk section. So essentially, from 1 through 3 to 4 and following, we're moving from the heavenlies to the homelies. We are to bring heaven into our home. We are to bring theology into our home. And I'll just tell you, as husbands and fathers, that's our job. We are to be the theologians of the house. That does not mean that the, the wives cannot know theology and should not know theology, but it is our place to be the theologians of the home. So watch what happens. Walk worthy. Chapter 4, verse 1. He is going to start this off. So here's the flow. 4, 1 through 6, 9. He says, walk in unity, walk in non-worldliness, walk in love, walk in light, walk in care. Okay? So four commands of walk in 417 through 515. Further expand on this initial statement of walk worthy of your calling in 41. So therefore, if we are wise walkers, if we are light walkers, love walkers, new man walkers, unity walkers, then we will be worthy walkers. So that's a heavy task. We are to all bring all of these things into the home. But notice how it continues to build. So here's the flow then. He moves on. Not as fools, but as wise. Not as unwise, but know God's will. Not drunk, but filled in spirit. Three negative positive statements then further define walking in care or walking with diligence, all defining walking worthy. This is why broad context, you got to think beyond just the minimal, right? So then we have these participles that flow out of this, speaking, singing, making melody, giving thanks, and then submitting. And then out of these five participles, then we flow into the home, husband and wife, father and children, slaves and masters. All of this starts in 4.1 and it all just tunnels down into the home. In other words, if we can put it like this, this is your other diagram that I gave you, it is essentially like this. All of those truths, walking in unity, non-worldliness, love, light, and care, all of that is to channel down into the home. Just think about that for a moment. So each one of these things, then we should figure out what is the truth that is being laid out there and then bring these things down into the home and apply them into the home life. You can't get any more pragmatic than that, right? That's putting flesh on it. We'll come back and look at this next Sunday and talk about how we implement some of these things. And the first one we'll look at, the primary one is unity. All of this flows then into the home, the prominence of the home, the prominence of the role of the husband in the home. Chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. We know this passage well. Well, at least husbands, we ought to know it well. We ought to have it tattooed on our head. But here's the thing. Here's what's fascinating about all three of these sections. These three paragraphs, notice the common denominator. Husband, father, master, right? The husband is in every single one of them. He is the common denominator. And when it comes to the children, notice verse 4 of chapter 6. Not parents. He doesn't say parents do not provoke your children into anger. He says what? 
fathers. That is the primary relationship. That is the primary one. That is the primary role. That is being let go today. I mean, you look at most of the sitcoms today, the dad and the husband are, are the idiots, right? And the wife is the one is the all-knowing, the omniscient one, right? And they treat them like fools. It's a complete reversal of God's order. And it isn't an inferiority, superiority thing. It is a divine order thing. It is a part of God's cosmos. And so the common denominator in all of these is that the husband, the father, and the master. And he takes that lead role. It's interesting that in this passage, 12 verses dealing with husbands and wives, it's a lengthy one. It is one of the most lengthy passages dealing with the household. You realize that only 40 words are addressed to the wife, 115 to the husbands. <laughs> So my dad assigned this passage to me in exegesis class in seminary. This is your passage, son. You walk through it. I was not married yet, but engaged to be married. So this is my passage before I got married to Les. Man, I got a spanking. 115 words addressed us, right? We're always concerned with the wives section. It's minuscule compared to ours. But the wise section, it's interesting how it brackets, verse 22, wives be subject to your husbands. He returns to that, verse 33, wife must also see to it that she respects her husband. So there is no doubt about the key role of the husband within the household. He is the one who sets the tone. We set the tone for the home. It's one of the reasons why I love Proverbs 4, that living legacy the father has to take the lead. He sets the tone for the home. I understand the mom spends more time with the kids than the father does, but at the same time, he sets the tone. And if he's leading and he is the head of the home, he sets the agenda. And she will lovingly, willingly submit to that. And we'll come back next week and look at the particulars, but the wife can undo his headship by how she responds to the husband and how she communicates that to the children. So here again, we have the father involved in all this, the husband's duty to the wife, the father's duty to the children, and then the master's duty to the slaves. Finally, the prominence of the husband and wife, chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. It's interesting because this is the first relationship he's going to look at. So as he takes all of these truths and he brings them down into the home, what's the first relationship? Husband and wife. Husband and wife. This is the linchpin to everything because out of that it flows into the rest of the household. If they are not on the same page, then nothing else in the house is going to work. And if God is not center, if He is not Lord, then they are not on the same page and nothing else works. Right? And so somehow we can, we can mock the issue of being on the same page, but it is crucial. It is crucial. And it is necessary. I just, I don't know how you, uh, others, husbands and wives go about this and parents. Les and I will converse often about this. How are we? Are we on the same page? If there is a time when we feel like we are out of sync, we stop and talk about it. How do we get back in sync? What, where are we off? Because we have to be on the same page. It sets the tone for what happens in the rest of the house. And the kids look to us. Look, if there's stability with us, there's stability with our kids. If they know that mom and dad are at home together and bound, they're, they're good. They're good. Right? But this is how God has designed that to be. So although we know that the husband has that, that key role, there is that role of husband and wife together. And this is how God designed it, in unity, serving God faithfully, obeying His commands. That's it. That's it. The, the problems are is when we begin to tamper with God's design, when we flip the order or change a few things up. Next week, we'll come back and we'll look at specifics. And the, the main one I want to look on is unity. And he's going to talk about giftedness and that. Those truths are very pertinent to the household and how we view each other. But may God help us as we seek to understand the importance of the household. And it does have a place in God's cosmic, cosmic plan, right? Our life in our little homes reverberates for generations. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you have orchestrated, designed it. You have given us this revelation so precise. You lead us in the pathway of your message, Father, and I pray that we understand what it is. Father, I pray that we understand the importance of your plan and purpose, your eternal plan, that you set in place long before you created anything. And Father, in that you, you established a place for each one of us in each of our households and the roles that we have. 
And I just thank you for the uniqueness of that, the privilege of that, the honor of that, Father, the dignity that it gives, the value that it gives all of our lives, Father, and the importance that it lays upon us and the obligations that we have in light of the fact that we are a part of families. Father, pray that we would constantly seek out your design, your order, and we would strive to walk in light of that. And pray that you are glorified by that, Father. I pray that this next week we'll be faithful in our testimony to the world as households, as families, husbands and wives and children, that we will declare the Lordship of Christ in all that we say and do. And we depend upon your Spirit in the process. We pray these things in your name. Amen.